Chapter 9 My birthday is at the beginning of July. I have always loved birthdays. I have a chain of birthday memories that run all the way back to the year I was three, although Dad insists that no one can remember that far. I got a doll for that birthday. She had real hair, not the painted kind, and was dressed in a ballet skirt, and when I took her out of the box, I thought she was alive. So you see, I do remember. Later there was a circus party when I saw my first elephant and ate my first cotton candy, and there was a bicycle birthday and the tennis racket birthday, and when I was 12 there was a birthday that brought trickle. But this particular birthday, the one on which I turned 16, there was no air of festivity. This was my own fault, for my parents wanted to give me a party. Sixteen is such a special age, Mother kept saying. Don't you want to invite some people to celebrate? Or if you'd prefer to have it just family, we could go out to dinner someplace nice and then maybe to play to a play. No, I told her. I really don't feel like doing anything. I've outgrown that sort of thing. The truth, of course, was that I would not share my birthday with Julia. Julia. Just the sound of her name was enough to make me feel slightly sick. When I heard my mother speak it, her voice filled with warmth. Julia, dear, you really must do some posing for me. It's a waste to have a beautiful niece and not to use her for a model. My stomach churned. Julie, my father called her. Every time he saw her, his face brightened as though she were the second daughter he had always longed for. I held myself apart from them all and watched, and it was a strange feeling as though I were a visitor from another planet observing something of which I was no part. I watched Julia smiling at my father and calling him Tom. I watched her helping mother in the kitchen, moving depthly about with a pan or a dish towel, taking over chores that formerly were mine. I watched Bobby tease her into a game of dominoes and saw Peter's eyes follow her about with a kind of hopeless adoration. But worst of all was watching her with Mike. For the first time in my life, I wished that he did not live next door to us, for it made it much too easy for him to wander over after work, for no special reason to sit on the porch steps and chat. He was as nice to me as he always was, nicer, really, for he no longer tossed me playfully playful insults or called me silly nicknames. He was politely formal and very kind. You look really nice today, he would say. I like your hair like that. Although my hair was no different from what it had always been. Is that a new outfit? When I was wearing the same tired pair of denim shorts and faded plaid shirt that I had worn all summer the year before. But he was not kind enough to try to hide his reason for coming. Is Julia around? He would ask, avoiding my eyes, and Julia always was. You're not mad, are you, Ray? She asked me. It wasn't as though I could help it. These things do sometimes happen. You made it happen, I said bitterly. You knew Mike was mine. He wasn't yours. Julia said in a reasonable way. People don't own other people. You told me yourself the first day I was here that you weren't going steady. I didn't break anything up. Mike says you were just good friends. That you've always been like a little sister to him. That's not true. I tried to speak with dignity. He may say that now, but he wouldn't have said it a month ago. Things change, Julia said with a shrug. This could not be denied. Things did change, and the thing that seemed to have changed the most was Julia herself. When I think back now, it is hard for me to decide exactly whom the picture whom to picture when I say the name Julia. There were three Julias, all different. There were the Julia who arrived with my parents the first day, hesitant and frightened, the haunted, tight-faced girl who stood uncertainly in the doorway in the shadow of my father and held out her hand to me and said hello. Then there was the later Julia, relaxed and self-confident, the quaint touch of the hills gone from her speech. This was... The Julia who plucked her eyebrows so that they no longer hung like bushes over her eye, huge eyes and used my lip gloss to widen her mouth and make her thin lips fuller and warmer. 
This Julia laughed and chatted and used Albuquerque slang and went with Carolyn to the hairdressers and had her thick mane cut and styled into a long shag. She's copied Carolyn, I remarked to Peter, who immediately bristled as though he had been personally insulted. You're jealous, he said. You've turned into a real cat since Mike threw you over. Threw me over? True though they were, the words cut me to the core. I could not believe that my brother had said them. What about you? Do you feel thrown over? I never went with Julia. But you would have if you could, I said cruelly. You fell for her like a ton of bricks, and you know it, and you're not over it either. So? Peter said, that's why I understand how Mike feels about her. No guy in his right mind could have helped falling for a girl like Julia. And she's got a right to choose anybody she wants. It burns me up to hear you run her down just because she has something that you haven't. What is it she has? I asked, really wanting to know. What are the qualities that have you and Mike so enchanted? I can't explain it, Peter said. It's just something, a kind of feeling, a sort of magic. And he blushed, embarrassed at having used a word that sounded so romantic. She's just special somehow. This was the second Julia. There was a third Julia, too. I would meet her later. So, by my own request, there was no birthday celebration for me. I looked at myself in the mirror that morning as I was brushing my teeth and told myself, you're 16 now, sweet 16, the age when lovely things begin to happen. But nothing lifted and sang within me. At the breakfast table, there were some packages waiting for me, containing a blouse and some earrings, two record albums. I opened them and said thank you my thank yous, but it was all rather flat and forced. I did not even feel like trying on the blouse, and instead of playing the albums, I put them away. In the middle of the morning, Carolyn came by on her way out of the pool to ask if Julia and I would like to go with her. We can have lunch there, she said. It's my treat because of your birthday. I don't feel like it, I said. Thanks anyways. Carolyn gave me a funny look and said, well, that's up to you. Are you coming, Julia? Yes, Julia said, as soon as I get my suit. She went upstairs, and while she was gone, Carolyn gave me my gift. It was a friendship ring with a tiny turquoise set in a silver band. I got it at Old Town a couple of months ago. I was so happy about finding it, I thought it was just the right present. Now, well, I don't know. Maybe you'd rather have something else. Of course not, I said. It's lovely. Why would you think I wouldn't want it? I don't know, Carolyn said again. We just don't seem the same as we used to be. We used to talk about everything, but lately you seem to have sort of walled yourself off. You never want to go any place or do anything. I spend more time with Julia these days than I do with you. Then maybe you'd like to give the ring to Julia, I said shortly. As soon as I heard the words, I wish I could call them back. They sounded so cold and bitter. I saw Carolyn flinch as though I had hit her. Carolyn and I had never in our lives said unpleasant things to each other. It was one of the proofs of our friendship that even when we argued, we never got angry. I bought the ring for you, she said now in a tight voice. You can keep it or exchange it or throw it away. It's all one with me. Here comes Julia now. You're dumb not to come to the pool. It's a beautiful day for swimming. They left, and I went out into the yard and watered the roses. Then, for lack of anything better to do, I strolled down the sidewalk and paused to say hello to Professor Jarvis, who was sitting in a lawn chair in his front yard, writing in a notebook. How did your your talk go? I asked him by way of greeting. My father read in the paper that you were scheduled to give a lecture on witchcraft to some women's club. The university women, he said, looking pleased that I had known about it. It went very well indeed. Thank you, my dear. It's one of the benefits of retirement to have the time to do such things. 
It's funny the university women would be interested in such a fairy tale subject, I said. A fairy tale subject? His pale blue eyes crinkled as he smiled. Now, that's where you're wrong, Rachel. The subject of my lecture has nothing to do whatsoever to do with fairy tales. What I spoke about was modern day witchcraft of the sort that's practiced right here in this country all the time. You're kidding, of course, I recorded him with amazement. Nobody in this day believes in something like that. No. He laid the book down on his lap. Then why is it, pray tell, that there are over 400 witch covens in existence in the United States at this very moment? You mean people who practice real magic? I explained. That depends upon your definition of magic, Professor Jarvis told me. If you mean the fairy tale stuff, then probably not. But if you accept as a definition of magic that one originated by Alistair Crowley, the question is debatable. Mr. Crowley is one of the best known of modern day witches, and he calls magic the science and art of causing changes to occur in conformity with will. In other words, he describes magic as the utilization of the mind force to make things happen as they are desired. Do you think that's possible? I asked doubtfully. The professor nodded. If I did not, I would certainly not be giving lectures on the subject. We know that the mind has powers and often go undeveloped. Scientific tests conducted in laboratories have proved that certain people have more control over their mind forces than others. There are people who can predict the turn of a card or tune their minds in on events that are occurring at other places. Why then is it unreasonable to believe that there might be other people who can channel this mind force outward and create happenings instead of just know about them? And such people are witches? Some of them call themselves that. Have you ever really known one? It was crazy, of course, but I was fascinated despite myself. I'm not sure, but I think so, Dr. Jarvis said seriously. Back when I was first teaching at the university, I had a student who came from a particular secluded area of the Ozarks. Her name was Ruth, and she had been raised in the atmosphere of witchcraft, for her mother and aunt saw claim to be practicing witches. Whether this girl was one or not, she had been taught a number of charms, which she used quite freely. She used to talk with me about it, knowing my interest in the subject. I remember one time in particular, he smiled at the memory. Ruth was in love with a young man who was a member of the basketball team. It was an extremely good-looking boy and very popular. He dated one of the cheerleaders, and as soon as they graduated, they planned to be married. Well, Ruth decided to do something to offset that plan. She attended an after-game party in the cheerleader's dorm room, and while she was there, she went into the bathroom and got a couple of hairs out of her rival's brush. She took these back to her room and made a little statue out of beeswax and stuck the hairs in it. Then she lit a match and began melting the wax figure. She let a couple of drops of wax fall, and then she blew out the match and went back to the party. Well, it just so happened that while Ruth was in her room performing this little ceremony, the cheerleader had become suddenly ill with stomach pains. The party broke up, and the basketball player boyfriend was leaving just as Ruth reached the door. They stood in the hall and chatted a few minutes, and then Ruth suggested in a friendly way that they go back to her own room where she had a hot plate and could make some coffee. So they did, and she brewed the coffee and put something in it. I think she referred to it, the ingredient as milfoil, but I believe it was actually a part of a plant called Achillea milifolium. From that night on, as far as I know, Ruth and the basketball player were as steady to some, and he never looked at the poor little cheerleader again. What a story! I explained, you don't really believe it, do you? Well, I received it second hand, Professor Jarvis said, so I cannot be absolutely certain. What I do know is that Ruth herself believed it. As far as she was concerned, it had a happy ending. She and her ball player married and moved to California where he played professionally for many years and finally retired to open his own sporting goods store. I still receive a Christmas card from them every year. They seem to be very happy. 
A wax doll, I said slowly. She melted a wax doll. That's correct. Professor Jarvis, I hesitated, hardly knowing how to ask the next question. Was there anything about Ruth, about her looks, that made her different from other people? Was she especially beautiful? No, the professor said. In fact, she was quite ordinarily looking. Very nondescript features, a short, dumpy little figure. Nothing anyone would ever notice except for her eyes. Her eyes? She had strange eyes, Professor Jarvis said. Sometimes they seemed opaque, closed over. Other times you would look into them and it would seem they were so deep they had no bottom. I think that if Ruth did indeed have powers of the kind she attributed to herself, her eyes were a focal point for them. And another odd thing, though, she most certainly was not beautiful in, in any accepted sense of the word. There were those who swore that she was, though. The people who were closest to her, the ones on whom she concentrated her attention, seemed to see her with different eyes from the rest of us. They found her very beautiful indeed. Professor Jarvis, I said shakily, do you know why I asked that question about her looks, her eyes? There was a moment of silence, and the old man said, I think I do. You met Julia, I said. Could she? My dear, I don't know. I, I did meet her, but only briefly. I must admit, the eyes did startle me. They very much resembled Ruth's. However... There are many people in the world with vivid and interesting eyes. My own beloved wife had fantastic eyes, and the last thing she ever could have been was a witch. You simply cannot go around thrusting labels upon people because of physical characteristics, which may mean absolutely nothing. But there are other things, too, I said. There is the wax figure. I found it one day in the back of her bureau drawer. I thought at the time that it was just an odd-shaped ball, but there was a shape to it. It was elongated with a short, with a sort of knob at one end, which might have been a head. There were four lumps sticking out of the corners like the legs of an animal. Like the legs of a dog! Rachel, my dear, you are jumping to conclusions, the professor said. My story has disconcerted you. A lump of wax. There were hairs in it. Hairs the color of trickles. Rachel. He raised a hand as though to hold back my words, but his eyes had taken on a certain sharpness that I had never seen in them before. Could you tell? I asked excitedly. If I brought it to you, could you tell? Not definitely. But you would know if it was possible, wouldn't you? I mean, you've seen such figures before. Yes, I have seen such figures. I would certainly have an opinion as to its authenticity, though an opinion is not proof. Then wait here, I told him. I know right where it is. It will only take a minute to get it. Without giving him a chance to reply, I turned and began to run back along the sidewalk, past the Gallagher's house, and into my own yard. I bolted up the porch steps, through the front door, and up the stairs and down the hall to my room. It was ridiculous, it was insane, but I could not help myself. I had to find that figure and take it back to Professor Jarvis. Wildly, I jerked open the top drawer of the bureau and began to rummage inside. I felt along both sides and under the piles of the clothing. Then I removed the whole drawer and set it on Julia's bed and threw everything out of it. The wax dog, if that was indeed what the figure had been, was gone. But I did find something else, so flat and thin, against the base of the drawer, that I would never have located it by touch alone. It was a photograph of me, one of the discards from the set of the snow pictures that Mother had printed the month before. The face and body were covered with what appeared to be splotches of bright red paint.